Okay. Good afternoon or morning for those of you on the West Coast. I'm Carol Gray Preston, and as the leader of innovation and strategic initiatives here at Addis, I have the distinct pleasure of serving as your moderator for today's discussion. We're here to explore a critical subject, the capacity of 6G technology to revolutionize our approach to the urgent social and economic issues prevalent in North America. Our conversation will not only delve deep into the multifaceted opportunities presented by 6G, but also critically examine the risk involved. A key focus will be exploring how 6G can be harnessed as a powerful tool for global betterment, envisioning a future where technology drives improvement and prosperity worldwide. And we're joined today by a stellar panel of experts whose diverse insights and backgrounds promise a thought-provoking exchange. Thank you for being part of this pivotal discussion. Okay, now let's meet our esteemed panelists. It's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Colleen Josephson, Assistant Professor at UC Santa Cruz, known for her innovative work in sustainable wireless systems and energy sources. Her academic journey took her from MIT to Stanford, contributing significantly to fields like low power communication, her experience also includes a significant tenure as a research scientist at VMware. And I'll add that while she was in that role, we were fortunate to have Colleen serve as the working group chair for the societal and economic needs uh, group, as well as the vice chair for the Green G working group as part of the Next G Alliance. Shifting our attention to seasoned expert in telecommunications, please welcome Dr. William Lair, a research associate at MIT who's over 20 years in the internet and telecom sectors have made him an influential figure in both academia and global policy arenas. With a PhD from Stanford, Dr. Lair brings deep insights into the economic and regulatory intricacies of today's topics. Expanding upon Dr. Lair's profound insights, we now have uh, and I want to introduce an individual whose contributions are pivotal in shaping broadband strategies worldwide. Please welcome Dr. Edward Otten, Assistant Professor at George Mason University. Renowned for his innovative decision support models for broadband infrastructure, Dr. Otten's work has a global reach. An alumnus of Cambridge with a track record of impactful project leadership. He champions the advancement of sustainable internet connectivity and is a key, strat key strategist in global broadband innovation. As we explore the intricate realms of privacy and AI, we're joined by a standout expert from Ericsson, Greg Phillips, at the forefront of privacy, AI, and user experience innovation. Greg integrates diverse fields, a testament to his robust academic roots, including his recognition as a Herb York dissertation scholar. His fusion of deep technological insight with a focus on human connection renders his perspective indispensable in today's dialogue. And I'll also add that Greg plays a crucial role in our societal and economic needs working group at the Next G Alliance. Shifting gears to strategic foresight, we're privileged to welcome a top futurist, Dr. Amy Zalman of Deloitte. She's a strategist renowned for her acumen in equipping organizations to flourish in an increasingly digital world. Her illustrious career encompasses leadership at the former C as the former CEO of the World Future Society and founder of Prescient, a foresight consultancy advising Fortune 500 firms governments and nonprofit organizations to anticipate and prepare for the future. So with this, a very diverse and experienced panel, we're set for an insightful discussion. So let's dive right in. Today, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution where the digital and real worlds are converging at an unprecedented rate, propelling us into an era where automation could become the norm for an array of tasks thanks to the synergistic power of AI and 6G. However, the future isn't just about technological advancements, it's also about the economic decisions and the moral implications that come with automation. 
it's crucial to recognize that these decisions aren't solely about efficiency. They're equally about equity, challenges to, challenging us to reevaluate how markets operate and the role of regulation and governance and ensuring fair competition. So in the background with this dynamic and complex landscape, I'd like to pose a question to each of our panelists. What does 6G mean to you personally? How do you envision it influencing these various aspects of our future from automation and economics to equity, moral challenges, and the management of risk in an increasingly connected world? So if each panelist could take about two minutes for their answer, I'll start with you, Bill. And can we hear him? <laughs> Not quite. Didn't there you go. Hi, now Cal. Thank you. you. Can hear <laughs> Thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction, and it's a real pleasure to be talking and to be sharing uh, the stage, so to speak, uh, with uh, the other distinguished discussants on this. Uh, so as already mentioned, I'm an economist who works with computer scientists and network engineers at MIT, and we're engaged in uh, R&D efforts to develop the next generation of digital technologies, which includes much of what 6G is focused on. 6G doesn't mean any single thing. But one perspective is that 6G is a technology research roadmap, vision for the infrastructure that's needed to enable the most ambitious versions of what is called the smart X future. That's a future in which ICT technologies or network digital computation communication technologies can be used to automate virtually any task. That is augment and therefore alter the human role in the task. That's already happened in many of our appliances where digital control boards sit between the user and the electromechanical systems that operate our dishwashers, HVAC systems, and car braking systems. The 6V vision is of the networks needed for the most ambitious visions of the metaverse or an AI-fueled virtual and augmented reality applications that are needed to enable smart healthcare, which includes AI replacement limbs for amputees, memory enhancements, et cetera smart energy grids to manage renewable power, and smart decision-making tools such as digital twins. The 6G roadmap is a, is a horizon vision that, like the horizon, extends beyond what we can do today. The innovation technology development cannot be like visions of the flat earth, where when we get to the edge, we are going to fall off. We need a technology research roadmap to coordinate global cross-disciplinary development efforts, to understand what is possible and evaluate alternative architectures, which involves experts across many techni uh, technology disciplines and includes non-technology experts whose inputs need it if 6G is to fit into our vision of the world we want to see. So let me start with that. <laughs> <clears throat> Now you're muted, Carol. That's really, yeah, yeah I know. I had your disease. <laughs> okay, Ed, how about you? What does 6G mean to you? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm going to speak very pragmatically about what I think 6G is going to be, and that's essentially more bits, uh, more spectrum, and a, a denser network, because that is ultimately the three ways that we can increase the capacity and improve the quality of service of a wireless network. So that's kind of where essentially we are going. And then there's a set of about six or seven key technology groups that are kind of at the forefront of basically delivering that. So I think firstly, it's kind of more of the same in that we're expecting virtualized, open, flexible networks. So that was um, uh, that's certainly key to 5G standalone, but in 6G it will just be native uh, essentially, and that's going to potentially have benefits um, for energy efficiency, uh, cost, and then also actually flexibility for providing the network. Um, I think we're going to get much more spectrum at terahertz. Whether that will actually work or not remains to be seen. Um, we've seen quite a few of the millimeter wave spectrum licenses actually taken back from some of the mobile network operators and quite famously in the last couple of months in Korea, which was kind of, you know, the poster child for 5G. So I still somewhat remain <laughs> skeptical about the use of these kind of higher frequencies. Um, so I think that that's kind of important. Um, we do have some you know, machine learning being integrated into um, new, newer standards, but I think in 6G it's going to be um, there basically to do automated network management. There's certainly a whole heap of research in that space. So they're all kind of continuing trends. 
uh, from, from the existing kind of 5G context. Um, I think really the kind of novelties are going to be moving towards the greater integration of non-terrestrial networks. And I'm going to pause here and leave that as my final thought. But the reason why I say that is important is because cellular is fantastic at providing wide area coverage. And that's where we have lots of problems. So I think actually some of the social and economic benefits that we can get from providing reliable coverage globally um, could be quite significant. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, Colleen. On the unmute button. There we go. <laughs> it's tricky. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think what Ed was getting at um, towards the end um, is is uh, kind of core of what I want to highlight. Six G's, a lot of things. So I'm going to focus on just one thing. Uh, a key aspect of this next generation network will be making the network more invisible to users and applications. You know, ultimately, what we want to enable is connectivity. And in the end, do the users or the applications really care whether that connectivity comes from cellular or terrestrial or wireless or Bluetooth? No. Um, you know, as we seek to reduce digital inequality by bringing broadband to as much of the population as possible, where broadband is, you know, broad bandwidth high um, throughput internet connectivity, um, whether it's wireless broadband or otherwise, um, networks are going to need to continue to stitch together multiple disparate um, connectivity modalities. We're going to have, you know, as Ed mentioned, low earth orbit, traditional longer range cells, micro cells, and even more technology in between that hasn't yet been invented. And uh, we, we need to make that work together seamlessly. And that's, you know, I think my two cents, um, and I'll hand it over to the others to hear what they have to say. Great, thanks. Okay, I'll call on Amy next. Getting myself unmuted. Um, so I, thank you for that introduction to me as a, as a futurist. I'm hopeful that it is not really um, painful then to hear that I think 6G to me um, when I think about what I think about all day, which is how people experience and perceive and respond to change is much of the same, but more so of the world that we're already living in. Um, I believe that currently, right, 6G, but also 5G, we live in a world of promises as, as everyday people of what could be a lot of visions, um, what Bill referred to as um, sort of aspirational horizons that are dramatic um, and hyperbolic. And then we live in a world of kind of creeping transformation, like the invisibility that Colleen talked about. So we don't really notice how incredibly dramatically things are changing while we're sort of either alarmed or thrilled by visions of things that are kind of inevitably always out of reach. Um, it, on that, I think I would just say one thing, which is that I did. I went back and I looked at um, 5G, which might be every day for the rest of you, sort of 5G levels of penetration, meaning devices, not right networks, what people are buying them. But um, around the world, um, it's low. People are living in 3G and 2G and 4G environments. Um, so, so one of the spaces, if we're talking about human and societal needs, where I think both uh, sort of nations, societies, and individuals are living is in um, a, a world of promise of equity and capability and a lived experience globally of, of a variety of forms of, of inequity and difference. Um, and, that, and that is something that, that is fully evident in the 5G world and um, looks to, to be something that we will continue to live with unless we decide to do something about it, which we very well can. Great, thanks, Amy. Okay, Greg. Yeah, I, I really love like just the the scale of the answers here. A lot of them have brought us to this this place of like we have to do these these new uh, technologically demanding and innovating things at at scale and also do them seamlessly. I think Colleen and Amy, those are those are wonderful points. Um, and and when I conceptualize each successive G, um, I, I really see them as helping us to understand. 
a challenge emerging from these complementary societal and technological arenas. And for 6G, the, these junctures lie sort of squarely in the interaction of networks with these emerging AI native technologies and the proliferation of these really low latency, really non-localized computing needs across all of these different industries we're interacting with. All right, and we have to wrestle with some really, really tough inequities and sort of a backlog of challenges that occurs because we're working across devices that run on different generations of these Gs, right? And so um, 5G for us introduced sort of these core capabilities that are necessary to run these bandwidth hungry applications at these really low latencies, uh, but the scalability of these capabilities and the capabilities that came before them, um, right? And their uh, ability to empower the highly scalable and adaptable uh, sort of, if we think about the core things right now, AI and XR capabilities that we're seeing on the horizon is going to demand more of this network specialization and adaptability that we just sort of see as expected. People don't want to see the network. People don't want to necessarily interact with the, with the technologies that make their lives easier. And so what 6G means to me here is more adaptive, AI native, and next generation technology empowering networks that are capable of meeting these massively scalable, low latency, and data intensive applications across, as Ed uh, and Will talked about, uh, these broad geographic expanses and integration with pre previous uh, iterations of these technologies that bridge these divides that we see popping up and that we're going to discuss today. Thanks, Greg. So now I want to navigate through a series of these critical themes that you guys have highlighted, um, ranging from the potential benefits to the inherent risks and maybe the role of collaboration um, in maximizing its positive impact. So first, let's let's talk about the transformative potential of 6G. So I'll start with you, Colleen. How instrumental can 6G technology be in narrowing the digital divide, and what concrete actions are necessary to ensure it doesn't deepen existing inequalities? Yeah. So I'll I'll start off with that from a, um, a perspective of. Um, I attended this great workshop this summer on uh, rural connectivity. And, um, you know, I was aware of this, but I was reminded of the fact that there's a really robust uh, interdisciplinary community of academics who look at the technological and societal challenges of making even the most basic connectivity available to underserved populations. Uh, but what we see is that historically, a lot of research has been funded on creating networks with high throughput and low latency, um, and less of a focus on the, the connectivity aspects. So, um, you know, every time there's a new G, there's a, a boom of funding available. And uh, if we want to, you know, bridge the digital divide and take tangible steps towards that, what I would say is that we should be funding this type of research community, um, which thus far has not significantly benefited from the R&D funding booms associated with the previous Gs. All right, thanks, Colleen. So Ed, regarding 6G, there's a lot of discourse about the potential to, to bridge the digital divide, yet some experts, yourself included, have voiced concerns about the practicality of these optimistic projections. Could you delve into some of your reservations and explain why you believe 6G might not be the panacea for reducing the digital divide as it's often representative or also presented, sorry? And additionally, what specific challenges do you foresee and what conditions would be necessary for 6G to make a meaningful impact? Thanks, Carol. And I think that my perspective has been built over the past two years where we've been finalizing the World Bank's 5G flagship report, where we've looked at exactly this topic. OK, so we, we've carried out a number of pieces of analysis. And the reality is that the device handsets are more expensive for a variety of reasons. The ships are more expensive than just using a vanilla 4G um, form of connectivity. Um, and that device economic um, uh, cost is really significant when you're trying to serve people who are, who are really kind of getting closer to the poverty line. And I say getting closer because I think rounding up a little bit, about two thirds of the global population is now online. But actually that number that we've been incrementing each year has been slowing because we're basically coming up against um, some really challenging 
uh, economic costs for deploying a handset. So you can pick up a handset now, a basic and kind of 4G enabled um, feature phone for you know tens of dollars potentially. Um, and that's that's really helped a lot of people get online over the last couple of years. Um, but I, I think that it would be um, wholly optimistic for us to think that we'd be able to kind of deploy 6G handsets um, at a reduced cost where we're going to basically enable these people who have been struggling to get on with previous generations to kind of um, leapfrog straight forward to this, this newer generation. So I think that that's my, my initial hesitation to, towards that. All right, thanks, Ed. So maybe moving on to sort of the quality of life and economic growth aspects. Amy, what ways do you see that 6G may alter our traditional notions of those? Are we on the brink of a paradigm shift here? I mean, I think we're living through it, which is not to, right, I know we're supposed to be talking about 6G, but I mean, these to the you know right we're sort of going through these generations i i so uh, i mean it's funny because i was still thinking about the ed's answer to the last question I, I mean i think that maybe the transformation is in the way we situate technology in these spaces like quality of life and digital divides and economic and educational betterment so to the degree that we are getting closer and closer to our technology, that it is becoming absolutely right a requirement to participate in society, to participate in an economy, to participate in a community, possibly in a family sometimes, right? Just to, to be, the more that digital does not need to be attached to these other qualifiers of what it means to like live well, to divides, to quality of life and so forth. So, so, so my response to this is around sort of policy and the way that we kind of in the mainstream think about what it is and how we go about transforming which is not by thinking about how we make the digital better but how we make right how, how we address the thing itself quality of life which i now realize did not answer your question at, at all um about uh, our quality of life um i don't know if it's better or worse we are I don't know how many things you have sitting on your desk right now. I have seven, seven digital and wireless devices. It is different from, right, from the way it was 30, 30 years ago. And in some ways it is magically better and in some ways not. So simply being attuned to those changes is better. I will answer in better ways in questions to come. Okay, look forward to that. Um, <laughs> So I guess moving on, I'm looking at sort of this whole notion of 6G acting as a catalyst for global unity um, rather than widening the technological gaps among countries. Bill, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, there's sort of a synthesis of the calls we've heard before, we, we, the comments we've already heard. So. The first is that 6G absolutely, I think, will expand digital divides and also be a solution to digital divides. It'll expand them because the vision really is a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift, as it rolls out, uh, is not going to roll out across industries, firms, countries evenly, which means there's going to be big disruption costs. Um, it's an opportunity, and, and I think in that, whereas earlier ones uh, tended to be much more sort of silo-based, I think the focus and the kinds of questions we've heard, like Colleen saying, it's a, it should be more about um, making the networks be transparent to the applications of the users. They should just have what they need working, not necessarily worry about the technologies by how they work. 6G, by being much more inclusive, and by even drawing in the non-technical folks like that we have on the call today, I think is is optimistically heralding what the possible future might be. But um, these are tools and uh, certainly uh, the people that are able to get on board with these and take advantage of them really fast uh, are, gonna, are gonna see benefits. And one of the challenges we're gonna have is managing at the same time the lower end of the divide. In other words, who are the people that don't have even the most basic stuff they need? And then the higher end of the divide, the fact that someone may want you know, um, uh, 10 gigabit speeds and need it in a particular application shouldn't say, shouldn't be the enemy of, of the other. And managing both ends of that spectrum is from a policy political perspective is always a difficult challenge. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so maybe we can move on to some of the possible risk with 6G and maybe look at some of the, the questions there. Um, Colleen, I guess, looking at 6G, could it usher in any unforeseen cyber threats or intrusive digital surveillance? I know that's been discussed as a potential threat. Uh, absolutely, I and mean, I think that's true with any um, new or you know iterated upon technology. Um, you know, as Amy mentioned, the the way that we live has simply changed phenomenally in the past few decades. We have vast volumes of personal data being generated and tracked, and uh, this introduces increasing privacy and ethical use concerns about what kind and quantity of information is being passed around and to whom. Um, you know, one thing that I think about at the intersection of security and privacy, uh, a, a concern is the ability to observe and manipulate uh, users' information streams without authorization. So, you know, um, a, a frequent talking point in the 6G community is enabling highly immersive technologies like VR and XR, and uh, some I've even heard some people talking about futuristic brain-machine interfaces. So now we're suddenly upon, you know, if that's a reality, a future where it's possible for bad actors to literally change how people are perceiving their world. So, um, you know, when you think of it that way, it's absolutely um, necessary for us to be designing 6G to protect network integrity and ensure the privacy of user data. I guess absolutely it's out there, but um, yeah. So, I, actually, I'll let me ask Greg because I know he's he's looked at this a lot. What steps should be taken to integrate um, trust into the 6G framework? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of what Colleen just mentioned is extraordinarily relevant, right? When we when we talk about what the network's role in facilitating trust is, I think we have to separate trust into a couple of different dimensions. The one dimension is absolutely the, the core security uh, and privacy concerns that we have in the transit of sensitive types of information. And as the domains that use those informations get more and more immersive, as the technology scales to create more immersive experiences, I think this is something that is is sort of viscerally terrifying for a lot of people, um, and, and as it should be. And so, from a from a security and privacy in the network point of view, we turn to the same places that I think we turn with each successive G. Uh, we we look to the standards that we we carry into the network. The the major actors agree on the security specifications and uh, put those out in the open to be scrutinized by a a very uh, deeply knowledgeable academic and pra uh, practitioner community. But there's this other dimension of trust that I think Colleen has hit on that's really, really important, which is how do we get people to trust networks to do the increasingly dangerous things that we do over the network, right? Um, and this is this is a real like industry uh, wide issue that we need to come together to solve because these technologies by themselves um, that are being enabled by increasingly competent network technologies um, are quite scary i think uh, and when we talk about trust we're also talking about consumer trust uh, in the ability to carry out really complex uh, operations um, for example in the metaverse as was mentioned earlier or um, in ar vr in um, you know with ai based applications and the protection of data and transiting uh, of that data is something that we you know have a core responsibility to demonstrate can be done over the network but i want to maybe bring some optimism in into this the ability to carry out increasingly complex operations with very, very low latency budgets also empowers people to use the technologies that we want them to use from the privacy and security end. Um, and I think this is something that that holds a lot of promise. Uh, the ability to unlock, uh, you know, higher uh, bandwidth applications that can run with additional privacy technologies on top of them, that's usually the biggest constraint, right, with a, with a uh, you know, the same or, or you know, uh, perhaps optimized uh, quality of experience on top of that um, and running in a way that we can guarantee is secure based on the standards work that we've done to make sure that the network um, the, the network has these security features, I think is, is a really, really promising way forward. Yeah, certainly a key, a key um, thing to be considered as we just design 6G networks. So another another key risk is or a concern is is the environment. So Colleen, considering um, 
the high energy demands of advanced networks. How can 6G development proceed without intensifying the environmental crisis? I think um, my thoughts here can be summed up uh, with the classic quote, uh, we can't improve what we can't measure. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail there. The previous generations of compute and communication infrastructure have designed to prioritize metrics like speed and throughput and latency or uptime. And what we are missing is energy consumption as a first class metric. Uh, so we want to see that added in as a primary consideration going forward so that we can quantify the energy consumption of our systems and uh, correctly attribute um, you know, which applications and processes are consuming what energy. It, it, in, in thought, it sounds simple, but we have an era of massive distributed systems. The, the simple act of figuring out where all of this energy going is actually quite challenging. Uh, so once we have a better grasp of this information, it will allow us to more rapidly prototype more energy efficient versions of certain algorithms and technologies. And two, um, if we make modifications to the network to optimize other parameters like you know, throughput, uh, we can use this, um, you know, these metrics to make sure that we haven't unintentionally modified the system to lead to excessive energy consumption. Uh, you know, and beyond these fundamentals, there's a lot of really interesting uh, research that's happening in the, um, you know, carbon aware computing community that's looking at things like adjusting uh, when and where certain compute workloads happen so that uh, we can leverage regions um, or time periods of lower carbon emissions. Ed, do you have any thoughts on sort of green communications? <laughs> well, well, I think the key issue is that um, improving the capacity of the network and the quality of the service of the network is correlated with energy consumption. And kind of pragmatically going back to how I started this, you know, we can increase the capacity of the network, the network by more bits or more spectrum, which means probably turning up the power of the base stations, or we can densify the network as the third option, which means we need to put a lot more um, RAN assets out there, which are all going to consume their own power. So, so we, we have this conundrum, which we haven't been able to tackle yet, where you simultaneously increase uh, the capacity and the quality of the service uh, at the same time as um, kind of reducing the, the, the energy consumption of the network. Um, so I think that that's a real challenge. I think, you know, going back 10 years is important because in this whole 5G debate, um, people were saying small cells, small cells, small cells, small cells were the future. But the reality is we got to 2018, 2019, and most of the operators kind of balked at the costs involved with densifying the network because there was basically very little uplift on the average revenue per user side. And that kind of fantastic technology which emerged around 2012, 2013, massive MIMO, was a bit of a curveball, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and it just kind of swooped in, and the cost economics were just so much more favorable to maintain your existing macrocellular base station um, and to not densify your network unless you really had to do it. And I think that, that, that that's an important lesson. You know, really densifying the network to the level where we deploy small cells is not very cost efficient, and it probably won't happen. And that's why I'm probably even more apprehensive about terahertz. Thank you. Right. So as we look at the evolution to 6G, it's not just as we've heard about the faster connections or more efficient network. There's our human side to this evolution. And this deeply affects the fabric of our societies. And one of the profound impacts of this advancement has always been its ability to transform the job market. And with 6G, we're not just talking about incremental change, we're potentially looking at a significant shift in employment dynamics as certain roles become obsolete, new ones are created, and others evolve to require different skill set. So Bill, what are your thoughts here on the potential changes to the job markets? Well, there's been a lot of people that have sort of uh, economists at first worried about, you know, uh, AI essentially replacing jobs and sort of the more modern and more reasonable thinking is it doesn't so much replace as it changes jobs. And the fact that jobs have been changing with the advent, uh, advance of technology is not a new phenomenon. It's been happening for a very long time. We've seen uh, a massive movement since, you know, World War II of uh, folks going into the service sector and the growth of the service sector. 
And um, certainly AI and all its network is gonna accelerate that even further. So that for example, a white collar worker who worked in the steel industry and did accounting in the steel industry was a steel worker. Today, that person would be in the service sector working for an accounting firm. And in the future, it may be some gig worker or maybe a computer that's doing some version of this. In such a world, people are gonna do more work and the initial empirical uh, evidence is actually that the AI and the robots and all that stuff is not uh, reducing jobs and is not destroying jobs. And so that that sort of fear uh, is, not, is not really the right one. However, the fact that it will cause adjustment costs so that if, you, if your job changes, someone has to prepare you for the new job you're moving into and has to make that possible. And so for example, all, and that affects everything. So like the rise of the gig economy has challenged traditional um, uh, safety net rules in, in the developing world and in the, in the domestic world. And we're seeing that now where you know Uber and Airbnb are as they become looking a lot like traditional sort of transportation or traditional sort of hotel companies are now sort of saying, well, geez, don't they need regulations like that? Um, so these sorts of challenges, these disruption in the management of these costs are gonna affect every level of society at the firms, the government regulations, and we need to think about that uh, as we roll these capabilities out. So, um, you know, I think it, it's not that, it, these things will affect your jobs, they will affect the way we think about jobs, but they're not gonna get rid of jobs, they're gonna change jobs, and who bears the cost of those changes in getting to a better future? That's the thing, that's one of the things that's so new that we have to think about. So Ed, I know you had some thoughts here too as well around, and sort of there's a not necessarily negative. So what are your, what you wanna share some of your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it, it is negative, you know. It's it's obviously awful if if um, you know you lose your job and, and that's that's a terrible thing. But I, I just mean looking back, uh, creative destruction drives humanity's progress. Okay, so we managed to mechanize agriculture, and that labor eventually was absorbed into the industrial manufacturing um, uh, factories in the 18th century, 17th and 19th century. So the industrial revolution, and then eventually through the 20th century, a lot of those people, as we mechanized um, manufacturing further, went into the service sector in many high-income economies. So, so that is part of uh, the creative destruction of um, kind of progress of our society. Um, and I think over the longer term, that brings with it great improvements in productivity, but also the lifestyles that we have become accustomed to. So, you know, we're, we've been able to improve healthcare outcomes, educational outcomes, all of these things have been driven by technology, general purpose technologies I'm referring to here. Over the past 300 years, so, you know, we had electricity, <laughs> we, we had a lot of infrastructure technologies, we had the internal combustion engine, and the internet is just one of those technologies which has taken place over the last kind of 30 years, which has caused a long wave of um, technological development, essentially, and, and that will probably continue for another 20 years on average. These waves usually last about 50 years until something else um, pops up and, and kind of drives that forward. Um, so I think... I understand people's hesitation, but I think also we need to recognize that, that this is how society over time moves forward. Obviously, there are things that government needs to do there uh, to make sure that we don't get to a situation where there are too many negative outcomes, and obviously they're political decisions. But um, yeah, I don't think we should be too afraid of this. Uh, my comment is always that those um, economies which have the largest demographic issues, um, you know, Japan, Korea, soon to be China, they are also the ones that have the highest robot density. So it is not the case that, you know, adopting all of these technologies simultaneously means that we're going to lead to large, it's going to lead to large job losses. Uh, actually, because of demographics across the world are probably declining, except for in low income countries, they could fill that gap of the labor force that will basically be disappearing over the next century. Thank you. Right. Um, so we actually have, before I get to the next question, I guess we have a question from the audience around um, the digital divide um, topic that we went through. So affordability seems to be a key challenge to address the digital divide. Is there anything we can do in the design of 6G to increase affordability? So Colleen, I know you talked a little bit about that already. The design of 6G. Um, and I think to be honest, I don't have, um, you know, a whole lot uh, from the fundamental um, aspects. And one thing that comes to mind that's kind of an overlap with 
some of the uh, sustainability talking points is, um, you know, we have these devices that get, you know, put into drawers and we have a terrible e-waste recycling rate. So, you know, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, can we create a more robust uh, used device ecosystem to have the simultaneous benefits of reducing the carbon footprint. There's an enormous carbon footprint associated with manufacturing the devices and make these, um, you know, reliable and, um, you know, still, you know, very long lifetime devices available um, more affordably to other users um, who maybe you know can't afford a new device, but um, they're very much in the market for a used device. And there's some pretty excellent research uh, going on from UC San Diego um, in this area of you know maximizing the longevity of devices. Um, their project is called Junkyard Data Centers. And they started using, um, you know, kind of used phones as data centers and have been able to, in, for some applications, achieve comparable performance to uh, traditional compute clusters. So, you know, I think um, looking at, um, you know, designing phones to be longer lived, um, more recyclable, et cetera, could have two pronged benefits for the environment and um, accessibility. Great. Okay. so. Maybe um, one last question, sort of in this sort of perils of 6G or potential impacts um, to Amy. How would the advent of 6G technology influence our daily social interactions and community structures? And what can we do to make sure it, it fosters a more connected, inclusive, humane society? I know that's a huge topic. Yes, I'm sure I'm not the only one with thoughts on it. Um, so I think the answer to many of the questions that were being asked that are not at the systemic space, but about people are increasingly occurring to me, they're very specific. They're, it's really hard to make grand statements. So for some, so depending on who you are, the capacities of, of 6G, of of faster, closer, potentially less expensive or easier to access technology radically improves your ability to communicate with others, to communicate with, to, to communicate, to get healthcare, to get needs met, to do work, to, to join in communities. For others, perhaps in ways that they don't quite notice until later, um, for example, for, for teenagers on social media, for example, it, um, it reduces their capacity to to be connected but i mean overall i would i feel very hopeful there was a question you asked us previously about uh, in various ways it um interfered with by systems our capacity to connect with people who are distant just gets bright just gets better and better and better um, we are growing in our capacity to be global and to connect with um, with with causes and with peoples and with uh, places that we did not know. So as I'm speaking, I'm also interrupting myself because I think that there are ways in which um, countries and governments are are helping to make that more difficult um, in some respects. But to stick with the question um, about connectivity. Um, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Like the metaverse and the kinds of like radical decrease in latency or radical entry into experiences that are enabled only in extended reality is both a place of connectivity and a place of um, of potentially like making us radically foreign to our own bodies ourselves. Um, so accompanying all these cap capabilities should simply be thoughtfulness by um, all the responsible parties, um, whether they're companies or or parents or educators, um, into the into the spaces where we might use them. Greg, did you have some thoughts you wanted to share on this one? Oh yeah, I my 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 thoughts um, were more speaking to the the affordability, but I'll move this more into a space of um, of cooperation. And, and Carol, just remind me, this question was related to uh, the global cooperation question, or or which one was this? 
No, how how does it sort of six G influence our daily social interactions and community oh. structures? Sorry, absolutely. I I no worries, no worries at all. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So I think that there are push and pull dynamics that the network can enable uh, that that really sort of. Uh, latch on to what the industry can make of them, right? And so if we have these capabilities to immerse ourselves in highly um, sensory immersive applications, which is one of the promises of 5G and 6G, uh, this is the, we can create that ecosystem through capabilities, but we're going to have to work with the industries that are going to make those experiences possible uh, from, a, from a sensory level, from a platform level, to really create experiences that bring people closer together. Right, connectivity by itself alone lacks the um, like lacks the edges of the kind of solution that is socially and economically and politically sustainable. Right, as Amy said, as Colleen said, we need government at the table. We need um, hyperscalers uh, who are capable of providing the full ecosystem experience available. We need standards governing the way in which. Um, we make this connectivity available and the way that it scales with the types of devices that are available. And so when we talk about um, when we talk about the, bringing things together in a community structure, the community also needs to be there. Um, and I think one thing that we excel at in the development of these types of technologies is um, is adaptability. Right? Uh, each G brings a new set of configurations that make new things possible. And one of the things that it can make possible is the ability for me to be here on this call with all of you. Um, and perhaps next time we do this, we'll be doing it in VR, uh, right? But, but in order for that to be an experience that people trust, that people will come back to and that people will use themselves, it's going to take uh, every actor that can help make that experience trustworthy and reliable at the table together asking, what are the social implications? Which is why webinars like this and why groups like SEN are so important. Thanks, Greg. So maybe let's transition to the whole discussion around recommendations for the in industry and our the work of our um, in working group. So transitioning to industry responsibilities, Colleen, how, how do you see or what do you think corporate leaders should um, embed in terms of ethical considerations in, R, in 6G R&D to meet some of the UN sustainable development goals? Sure. And so I think um, first I'll talk a little bit about um, you know, and so convincing um, industry leaders that that this should be a business priority. Um, and one one area where we can do that is by peer pressure. Um, company leadership uh, needs to communicate with procurement teams that there are important factors to consider beyond cost. So, for example, um, in my time at VMware, I once sat in on a customer call where we were being asked questions like, you know, what is the carbon footprint of this particular license? Um, you know, that having customers ask us those questions is a clear indicator of the customer's priorities, which obviously the supplier needs to take very seriously. Um, and then, you know, when, when this feedback is coming from the customer, what they've said is going to come into, you know, be taken into consideration when um, leadership is developing product roadmaps. So if enough customers are asking about certain topics that are aligned with the SDGs, then naturally it's more likely to become, uh, you know, a, a priority for the that company. So you know, that's kind of what I mean by peer pressure, and maybe you know, kind of as a as a more um, pragmatic um, and and applied technique. Um, you know, one way that we can make progress in this is uh, many companies have funds allocated for research um, that they they allocate for uh, industrial academic collaborations or as scholarships or as grants. And so these you know ongoing opportunities as we create calls for proposals in future years the call for proposals should be aligned with the um, sustainable development goal priority areas. So making it clear to applicants that, that these are things that the company values. And you know, beyond that, you know, allocating funds specifically to say, you know, you know, maybe we have, you know, 
the majority of it going towards more traditional uh, and exciting technological things. But we we dedicate to funding, you know, at least 25% of these projects uh, being um, more uh, aligned with the SDGs. And I think that sort of um, pledge and dedication would help prevent um, unintentional deprioritization for what might happen to be trendy at the moment. All right. So Bill, do you have any thoughts on sort of how to persuade industry to uh well, well first guess, off I would put that yeah, as a priority? Would, yeah, I mean first off I would agree with everything Colleen said. So I think absolutely uh, these technologies enable us to, for, for many, many different people, individuals to interact, form new types of organizations across countries, NGOs, multinationals, all these people, everybody should be part of this discussion and everybody should get involved. Having said that, I think it's also important to understand the, 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 that we don't put companies in sort of an, an untenable position. On the one hand, we do want them to have good leadership. I honestly do believe, for example, that forward thinking about planning for climate change and all that sort of stuff is actually good business financial sense. But on the other hand, um, you know, the companies basically are you know, uh, held to certain fiduciary standards. So government has to sort of establish the rules and, and, and help. And society has to tell government what those priorities are so that the politicians have the political support they need so that they can basically set the rules of the trade. It's, it's completely unrealistic to think that um, uh, governments can 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 micromanage this. It, you know, it's going to have to be markets, and there it's largely going to be global markets that are going to shape how this technology evolves. And and the, and one of the key things there will be standards. That's one of the reasons why I think think something like what we're trying to do with the 6G standardization effort is so important because it is one of the instruments where that could be really important. But it's certainly not enough um, if people don't push and ask the right questions, and the right people aren't involved then this whole system's not going to work. So it's it's that. And I think things like, for example, we, I absolutely agree with Colleen, if we don't get the right metrics there. Uh, so energy efficiency is one. Another metric I would mention is, is I, I would not think that 6G should be equated with connectivity. That is clearly the important thing. But if we don't have 6G connectivity, we don't have 6G, we don't also have computing and storage resources. And connectivity can also be highly delay tolerant. And, and if we have AI, we need a lot of edge computing. And so we want to make sure that people that are doing those other things, that the, that the, the subsidy schemes don't just go to, oh, just build the pipes, because that's all the connectivity is. 6G, even 5G, was an end-to-end -end redesign of the entire architecture with implications of the core all the way to the devices all the way to the chips and all up and down the stack 6g is even more that way and so that sort of integrated uh, vision of how those technologies tie together becomes even more complicated and important the optimistic thing is 6g and things like the sen working group has at least said here are the stakeholders we want to bring into this but those stakeholders for example if you were to ask me what's the economic impact of 6g i'd be like well, I can come up with an answer, but it's going to be a wild ass guess. And um, we don't have the data to answer that. And there won't be any answer. There'll be lots of answers. And it's the process for moving those answers forward and how they get integrated and used and talked about that, that the process can most contribute to. So one of the things, just picking up on your stakeholder comment. So one of the things that um, we've talked at, about in the SIN working group is sort of collaboration is going to be key um, to equitable 6G. And and we talked about the role um, nonprofits might play um, in extending some of these 6G advantages to marginalized communities. Um, Colleen, did you have any thoughts there on sort of what you think the role they can play would be? Could you repeat the uh, last sentence of the question, please? Yeah, so the, the role nonprofits might play in extending 6G? Yes. More, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so not for profits. Um, they're, they're a really interesting um, or type of organization because they are often the front lines of interacting with the community, uh, which, you know, Greg and Amy have talked about the importance of engaging community. And uh, a really major barrier 
to technology is often simply learning how to use it. And I think that aligns a little bit with some of what Ed and, and Bill were, were talking about earlier in the, these radical changes of, you know, artificial intelligence and et cetera. You know, a key aspect is, is as our jobs change, how do we learn to uh, adapt to these new technologies? Uh, so I think there's a really great opportunity for industry to be collaborating with not-for-profits to train the employees um, uh, slash volunteers who make that not-for-profit exist. And th those trained not-for-profit um, you know, employees can then train the community members, and that would go a really long way towards increasing technological competence. You know, kind of in my work at Santa Cruz, um, you know, I've been um, talking a little bit with the, the uh, regional uh, resource conservation, um, the Santa Cruz Resource Conservation Group, and they say that, um, you know, simply teaching a farmer how to set up a network, how to set up a soil moisture sensor, you know, that's one of the biggest barriers to seeing that technology adopted is they simply don't know how to do it. Yeah, the trick the trick is getting them um, engaged. But yes, absolutely, they have a lot to contribute. Um, maybe let's move on and explore some of the potential benefits of the 6G ecosystem in North America. And looking or considering some of the regional implications, Bill, should there be an emphasis on domestic manufacturing of 6G equipment? Um, we've seen a lot of legislation around this. And um, do you see that as using North American resources to spur economic gains? It looks like we might have some connectivity issues. With uh -oh. Bill, Bill seems frozen in time. <laughs> I, I dropped out. <laughs> okay. Did you hear my question? Uh, I think you were talking about sort of regional regional stuff. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, fundamentally, uh, these technologies are are, are largely software based and technology development. Uh, and 6G is going to be a global phenomenon, which means that um, it's going to go beyond uh, sovereign boundaries. It's not. You know, multinationals will play a big role in it, but today the multinationals are not under the control of any single individual nation. It's certainly the case possibly where an individual country might be able to destroy a multinational, but um, they're not in a position where they completely control them. And, you know, same thing's true about, you know, the, the social media and the internet web and all that stuff. And so I think that, the, you know, having and embracing an international dialogue and the role of international standards in this is going to be really important. Um, one of the biggest questions in the internet is whether or not there's going to be a fractioning of the internet into distinct, you know, communities, you know, and uh, that would be a loss, I think, to, to the planet uh, and certainly to our, to our stuff. So, but maintaining that while we also have uh, real differences and in, in security concerns, industry policy concerns is going to be a difficult thing to manage. So maintaining the forum where the dialogue can happen, knowing that not everybody is going to participate in the dialogue is necessarily going to be honestly trying to move it forward. Um, that that's just a challenge. That's a that's an on, that'll be an ongoing challenge. But the regional collaboration and the international collaboration is is essential if this thing's actually going to work. And the U.S. can play a big role in helping move that forward. So, Ed, in terms of 6G, what do you think will be the most consequential for the North American economy? Well, I think I'm going to go back to my coverage element again, and I'm going to draw on the history of technology. Um, and, you know, history doesn't help us predict the future, but it rhymes. <laughs> and, and what we see often with the history of technology is that you have a new technology which comes in. And really, it's only once you get to near 100% adoption of that new technology that can you actually decommission the old systems and that labor can go back into the economy and you get the productivity benefits of the, of the new technology that really kind of take off. Um, but overall for society. So, you know, I'm going to say that if we manage to make it so that we have decent, reliable coverage that we can rely on, <laughs> rely on it in the sense that it doesn't matter where we are, if we're in the Rockies, if we're in a really rural remote area, we can still rely on getting at least a basic level of connectivity, then actually I think there will be some large productivity benefits there because we'll be able to decommission legacy systems. Okay, I think before I maybe ask 
for everybody's thoughts. Um, we did have one other question from the audience. Um, devices in the future can not only provide users access to information, but also access to AI that can improve their productivity. Do you see the cost of not having access in the future to be even worse than it is now due to the loss of access to such services? So in, anyone interested in taking that one? This is an interesting perspective, I think. So like on the one hand, I think there's this sort of mildly rhetorical in the sense of like it, as we increasingly rely on a technological domain like, like AI, cutting off connectivity risks massive sort of consequences for an individual moving forward. But on the other, I think there are different ways of, of, of thinking of this, right? I think the, the entirety of our, um, our, our sort of concept moving forward into 6G of, of offloading critical features um, over the network poses some distinct risks, which is why redundancy uh, within the network, redundancy within uh, redundancy in computation, redundancy in processes is really important. I think one thing for artificial intelligence that's that's a, a an open question, especially as we um, evolve in the way that we think about things like generative AI, is the split between near and far computing. And so, uh, what what layer of um, <clears throat> what what layer of a process is being done by AI? Um, are there redundancies in the devices that we're offering in the computing that's being done locally within, let's say, a building versus being what's done over the network versus what's being done in the cloud? Um, and to what extent do we have? quick, readily available solutions to counter exactly this problem. Because as the problems scale up, so should the solutions. And I think as, you know, uh, from a 6G perspective, those are things that we're gonna want to keep in mind as we think about distance from the net, or from the place the information is needed that it's being held. Um, uh, Bill also had his hand up, I, I just started speaking, sorry. Oh, go ahead, let's keep going. I think you covered everything I would have said. Okay, you sure? Yep. All right. Well, um, I don't see any other questions from the audience. Um, so maybe what we will do now is maybe we've heard a lot of um, a variety of ideas and insights um, from each of you. So in light of our conversation, I'm going to ask each each of you to share with us one key takeaway or action item that you should be or that you believe should be at the forefront of our collective efforts um, as we navigate this journey towards 6G. Basically, what's the one thing you think as a collective, be it the industry leaders, policymakers, or the public, we need to prioritize to ensure that 6G is not only successful, but it's also equitable and secure and beneficial for society at large. So I'm gonna start with you, Amy. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll offer a small answer, which is sort of mechanical, um, and it has to do with participatory policymaking. Um, I mean, this it actually is something that you you know provoked in one of the earlier questions during the hour, but um, and, and it's about you know what organizations can now do. But this is a good time, maybe, in the consideration and development of 6G and next generation. The, the technologies it enables to begin asking um, polities and communities and their leaders what they want and need um, and getting more grounded. Um, and so because so much of this, because so much 6G, 5G, if you just look at right trying to buy a telephone is driven by a language and a promise and something that comes from very large marketers and companies to, to us. Um, I think that getting more participatory uh, is is uh, is something that actually should happen, um, and it's a good opportunity to do a kind of educating that Bill was referencing before too, which is um, understanding um, the multiplicity of areas where what 6G is exists and its ecosystems. So I want to go with participatory policy making, asking people what they need, not just telling them. Absolutely. Um, so Ed, what's your one key takeaway? 
So my final point is that we should focus on the cost efficiency of the technologies as early as possible in the standardization process. Because if we make the technologies cost efficient, all of those other downstream benefits will just kind of um, slip into place. Okay, we'll be able to solve the digital divide equity issue because the technology will be cheap enough for us to just roll it out based on the fact that the ARPU level is, is probably going to remain static or even decline in, in real terms. And, and that's the situation which we're working in. So I think I'll just reiterate Bill's point, which is that with the exception of about three countries, every country in the world uh, deploys their resources in telecom markets um, using market-based methods. And as a consequence, there has to be a profit gain for the operators to deploy the technology. And if we're up against sticky incomes because people are in poverty and they can't afford the devices, solving the cost efficiency early in the standardization process helps us solve all of those issues. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, Greg, your key t takeaway. Yeah. Um, I think if we were to pull on top of these great answers, uh, uh, an, an additional insight together it would sort of be cross industry and cross industry government collaboration. I mean, there, there are so many contingencies in the process of solving these really big picture problems um, that require input from more than just you know the, the the architects of 6G, but also the technologies that will depend on them. We've talked about densification. Densification takes ex like extraordinarily large investments in infrastructure and the technologies that that will sell people on this, that will sell people uh, within their governments on this, right, are going to be the kinds of technologies that we need to create the standards for uh, within and outside of the network. And so, if if we're thinking uh, ahead to a 6G that creates a case for further investment to solve these problems. We're thinking about talking uh, across industry. We're talking about uh, participating in a political process that's communicating with industry. Um, and we're thinking about the kinds of investments that that's going to entail um, down the line. Um, and to speak to Ed's point, we're, we're thinking about these kind of difficult problems in, in real terms, right? The solution won't be three five, eight thousand dollar devices in everyone's hands. It's going to be how do we uh, take the kind of capabilities that 6G creates and put them into people's pockets with the devices that they're realistically going to have? And what what are the scalability of the services that we're offers, offering on those networks? And that's a cross industry perspective. So, yeah. Okay, Bill, what's your key takeaway or one thing that you think we should prioritize? Um, well, again, I like the comments everybody else made. I think the highest level <laughs> one is that just think no roadmap is in fact a roadmap. No plan is a plan. It's just a bad plan uh, that we should look at 6G as a work in progress and that getting the right questions and engagement uh, is the right solution. But it's not having a single answer. And I think this is especially true in the context of the U.S. for the reasons that Greg just said. If you compare what that like, for example, what the Chinese can do with Huawei, they can have a centralized top-down end-to-end architecture. And I think that, you know, it's not necessarily a bad architecture. We can think about it. I think the attitude we've had to it has been a little too um, uh, dichotomous, uh, as in they're the bad guys and the U.S. is the right. But I think in the U.S., um, it is fundamentally how do we herd the cats across industry, and that is a big problem. And I think that the future is going to require, to make it economically viable for markets, is a lot more shared resources. And how we do that sharing with private markets is really hard. It's hard to share spectrum. It's hard to share antenna sites. It's hard to share you know, fiber in the ground and not have it owned by specific companies. But all of that has to be shared and the active software and that runs will have to be shared. And those those are just a bunch of technical questions there as to how you do that. If you're gonna get all these good capabilities and you're gonna be able to do it in a way that, um, you know, private sector firms can still see uh, a profit opportunity there uh, without it having to be so heavily regulated that, you know, you basically have killed the baby in the bathwater. Absolutely. So Colleen, you get the last word. <laughs> What's your key mm -hmm. takeaway or recommendation? Oh <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with awareness and education. Um, beyond what I talked about earlier with you know, educating users, we also need to educate our future technology creators. Uh, in my experience here teaching at Santa Cruz, when I interact with last year undergraduates or even graduate students, they're often completely unaware of the societal impacts of the technologies that they're uh, you know, trying to make careers out of. 
people are simply not being taught that technologies can have environmental impacts or lead to you know, radical shifts in what it means to work or simply exist. So in order for us to have thoughtful advancement of technology, um, the, the creators need to come out of our educational systems um, actually aware of the potential societal impacts of what they do. So for example, um, if we look at a roboticist, um, you know, one question that a well-informed uh, roboticist might have is how can my work at this company effectively train the workforce so that the robots and the humans at this, um, you know, could cooperate rather than having this paradigm of a robot replacing a company. And I think, you know, people coming out, uh, our future technology creators, people who will be replacing us here in this panel, um, you know, coming out of undergrad, uh, knowing what we now know as many of us, you know, doctors, um, that will go a really long way. Okay, great. So I don't think we have any more questions from the audience, but I want to thank all of our panelists today. Your expertise, perspectives, and visionary thoughts have significantly enriched our conversation. And it's clear that the journey ahead is complex, but it's also one full of possibility. And it's reassuring to know that such dedicated minds are leading the way forward. To our audience, I want to thank you for joining us and for your questions. And we look forward to continuing this critical dialogue as we collectively shape a more connected, resilient, and inclusive future. And thank you, and everyone have a wonderful rest of the day. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.